Well, good morning, Chapel Roswell. My name is Joe McKechnie, and I'm so blessed to be the pastor here. And it's an honor, a true honor, to be in worship with each and every one of you this morning. Now, I want to start off with a story. I promise it is 100% true. Okay, I'm going to not mention names to protect the innocent. But here is what happened. True story. Many years ago, I graduated, as you know, from the University of Georgia. I majored in broadcast journalism, and I was blessed to line up a job right out of college as a television sports reporter at a you know, medium-sized TV market. I eventually worked my way up to the sports director, which meant that I could kind of call the shots as to what we showed on the air. Now, I was a, a young man straight out of college, probably 22, 23. I was working in a city where I didn't know anybody, didn't know the way of life. Life and I, I just craved, you know, somebody I could go out with, somebody to date, you know, somebody just to have some, uh, some fun with. And, and I went to a college basketball game. I was there with a, a cameraman, and we were just getting some highlights of uh, the college basketball game. And I noticed as I was watching the court down below, there was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen in my life. Now, she was a decent player, not great, but she was okay, uh, but more importantly to me, and, and I, I stress and I, I repent, and, and I am the chief center amongst us when, when I come to many things that I've done. Uh, but uh, th this great looking basketball player, she was a, a college junior. I was right out of college, and so I was thinking, yeah, she might be someone that, that I could get to know, somebody that I, I might even get the nerve to ask out one day. Uh, now, it seemed like a good idea, but here is where the story takes an, oh my goodness, bizarre twist. I was on my way back to the station, couldn't get her out of my mind, that's just the way it goes, and I was trying to think of a way in which I could get to know her better. Then the idea hit me. Joe, that's what I call myself, Joe, you're a, you're a television sportscaster. Think about the opportunities you have to get to know her. So back at the station, I brainstormed, and I came up with a new feature we were going to debut on the evening newscast, the Student Athlete of the Week. And who would be the first Student Athlete of the Week? That girl. <laughs> so here's what happened. We, we made arrangements to, to go interview her. That was going to be a lot of fun. Now, the school's athletic director was, was pleased, certainly, that we picked one of his players, but he probably began to wonder, okay, now why is Joe coming to this basketball player? She, she's probably like the seventh best player on our team, scores maybe two points a game, doesn't play that often, and, and is a, it's a student. I mean, she's okay, maybe like a, a 2.9 GPA, and, and yet I was going to honor her as a student athlete of the week. Now, here's kind of what happened. I, I was able to, to meet her, and, and we, we, we talked, and, and I interviewed her. And, and true story, she probably thought something was up when my first question to her was, tell me about your boyfriend. <laughs> she said, I don't have one. I said, I like that. So here's what we did. I interviewed her. I was going to have some people put together this really cool news story in which I got to interview her and, and be seen with her, kind of side by side, which is what we're talking about this month. And, and so this was the girl of my dreams, or, or at least I thought at that time. And so I was able to, to interview her. Like I said, we put it in a really good sports story. And, and as one of the, uh, I guess, the privileges of being the student athlete of the week, I presented her with an oversized gift certificate, $25, to Ryan Steakhouse. Yeah, that's good stuff. Now, as my camera guy was packing up and we were headed back to the station, I mentioned to this girl, I would, I would love to get to know you a little bit better. She smiled and she said, that'd be great. People back at the station were kind of wondering what was going on. After all, uh, this was a student athlete who, who really wasn't a great athlete. She really wasn't even a, a good student. And yet she was the first recipient of the student athlete of the week. We went out. What, what happened on that date? Well, let me just say that the Ryan Steakhouse was really good. It was a good place. The truth is, at that point in my life, I, I wanted to be side by side with somebody. I, I didn't want to be alone. I wanted someone with, with whom I could share my life. And there was a comfort, you know, in being with someone else, not being all by yourself. I craved companionship in all that I did, but, but it would be years later, 
when I would really meet the real girl of my dreams, Catherine, whom I am married. So, no one wants to be all alone. We know that. You can see the graphic on the big screens, serving side by side. And that's the storyline that Jesus gives us into our passage this morning. Jesus assured his disciples, uh, just as he is assuring you and you and you and me, that we are not, by God, going to be left alone. How so? Well, let's look at the context of the scripture we're reading this morning. It takes us to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Jesus had previously, as you know, been arrested. He had been crucified, and and then there was the resurrection. Jesus was then after resurrection with his disciples for 40 more days until he was called up into heaven. And so Jesus told his disciples, look, guys, I'm going to be leaving you really soon. Uh, the, 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 the disciples didn't like that answer. What are we going to do without Jesus? He's our leader. We follow his lead. He, he protects us. He guides us. What are we going to do without him? But Jesus gives them an answer. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. These were the last words spoken by Jesus before he ascended into heaven. Speaking to his disciples just as he is speaking to you and speaking to me here and now. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus is telling his disciples that I may not physically be with you any longer, but God is not leaving you alone. To the contrary, Jesus says, God is pouring out his Holy Spirit to guide and to guard the disciples. Jesus gives them a a really solid but seemingly uh, intimidating command to be his witnesses, Jesus said, to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem was, was where they are, okay, where they were. And Jesus is saying, okay, I want you to be my witnesses uh, right where we are. Uh, but then Jesus mentions two regions, uh, Judea and Samaria. These were, were larger areas. and In other words, don't just focus on the local, as important as that is. I want you to spread out, and I want you to be my witnesses in other places out there. And then finally, Jesus is telling his disciples, his followers, to call on this mission. Okay, Our call to action, Jesus would say, uh, to follow this example. And so I think that that God has, in some ways, hardwired us uh, to understand, uh, to to receive, and to live out that good news. And we're called to to find ways to to bless and to serve and to help those around us. And here at Chapel Roswell, we have just so many opportunities, so many ways in which you can truly make a difference and an eternal difference at that. Do we have the passion to, passion to, to reach, to bless, and to help those around us and to serve those over there and maybe those way over there? Christ commanded his disciples to, to what? To be a witness. Uh, very often we hear the word witness, and it's kind of intimidating. What, what does that mean? But uh, I want you to think of a... Think of a judicial setting or a you know, legal context. If you're called or subpoenaed to be a witness, that simply means that you're sharing, you're telling people you know, what you know, telling people what you saw, telling people what you have experienced, what you have seen. In the case of Jesus, he's calling his disciples, his followers, to tell other people about what they have seen and how that has been nothing short of life-changing. So witnessing, what does that mean? It's just just telling your story. And that doesn't mean it's always by words. It doesn't mean it's always even uh, by having to pray out loud in public or something like that. It means that we are reaching out to serve those, to help those, to guide those, and to guard those. It's not easy. And truthfully, on my own, I, I couldn't do a good job. But that's the good news that Jesus offers. He's saying, you're not doing it, Joe, alone. Is Jesus merely telling the disciples what he thinks he wants them to do? Yeah, to a certain degree, but but he's not saying you have to go be good enough. You have to be brave enough. You have to know the right words to say, and and you have to know the right words and and when you're going to say them. No, he says the Holy Spirit, okay, God's presence and power living in each of us. We're going to be guided. We're going to be guarded by what Jesus calls us to do. We're not on our own. 
We are, in fact, side by side. We're partnering in this sense uh, with the kingdom of God through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me take you back a a few years ago. I remember my first uh, being a pastor right out of seminary. I was uh, called upon or challenged or entrusted or whatever uh, to start a new church right outside of Athens. I was straight out of seminary, and and honestly, I was a little bit intimidated about being a pastor. I I didn't know what I was going to say or or even how to do things. I was still nervous at times about standing up and and sharing things with, with the congregation whom I don't even know yet. And then I met James. James came to one of our Sunday morning worship services. He sat in the back by himself. He didn't talk to anyone. And as the service was wrapping up, even during the the midpoint of the last song, he he would quietly sneak out. One Sunday, though, he was still there. Before the service started, I went up and I shook his hand. I introduced myself to him. He told me his name was James. And I said, you know what? Uh, I'd like to to chat with you after the service if you're you're still around. And and he said, yeah, I would really like that. That would be good. And and so we talked. He shared a little bit about himself. Not much. He was still kind of guarded. But then I invited him to lunch. And so we had lunch together. He was a a nice guy. But over lunch, he was sharing a, a pretty sad story. He was sharing a bit about his life and how his wife had had kind of left him and took the kids and that he was seemingly now all alone and and his family kind of disowned him because of some of the mistakes, some of the things he had done. James confided in me that he was trying to claw his way out of a drug addiction. Furthermore, he said through using a lot of needles and drugs, he had contracted the AIDS virus. He was really sick, and he was frightened of dying. He didn't know what the future would hold. Uh, From James, I did learn that people don't really die from AIDS or or HIV. Rather, uh, AIDS and HIV just kind of kills your immune system. And so you might catch a a seemingly no big deal uh, infection, and you and I can just fight it off without any problem. Don't even know it's there half the time. Uh, but, But he wasn't able to. His immune system was all but destroyed. And so James said, you know what, because of of my actions with the the drugs, uh, I saw my my kids leave and and my wife left and and even my own parents and my own lifelong, longtime friends just kind of turned their back. And so I'm here by himself. James and I had many lunches together, I'd say maybe six or seven, but Over time, I could see that James was was getting weaker and weaker. Kind of made me as a pastor a little bit nervous because, you know, I don't know how to minister to him. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I spent some more time with him, though. I wasn't worried about, you know, catching an infection or anything like that from him. I knew enough about AIDS and HIV to to not really be scared. But but I still was a young, wet behind the ears, rookie pastor who just didn't know how to minister to James. One day I received a, a phone call from a guy, actually I knew him, he was another pastor. He served as the chaplain at a local hospital. And he said, you know what, James has been admitted. We're not sure how long he's going to last. He really seems like he doesn't have much time. He was dying, and he was dying relatively quickly. I remember going into James's room, and he had no visitors in there with him. There were, there were no cards or, or flowers or anything that people might have sent. In fact, the chaplain said that I'm really the first and the only person to visit James. I can't imagine the loneliness that he felt, the fear, I think, that he had, and how his decisions had had caused a lot of consequences in his life that he didn't like. And so I walked in, and it was like James was sleeping. In fact, it honestly looked kind of peaceful, but his body was quickly shutting down. He he wasn't uh, responsive. When I would talk to him, he, he, he wouldn't acknowledge anything. His eyes were open, but it's like he couldn't, either he couldn't hear or he couldn't respond to what I was saying. I didn't know what to say. He was the first person I ever met who, who had HIV virus or the AIDS virus, and he was the first person I ever met as a pastor who was dying. But I remember then saying a prayer for James. I held his hand. I could see the the drug needles all through his left arm. And I just prayed. 
And you know what, when I look back, I don't remember what I prayed. I don't remember what I said. I don't remember how I said it. But it was almost like I was a puppet to a, a certain degree where, where I was saying things that, that really weren't words that I usually thought of, the, uh, the, the ways to comfort him that, that I never would have thought of. And I realized what was going on afterwards, that, that the Holy Spirit was speaking through me to, to give Joe the, the right words to say, the right context in which to say them. Things that I'm not smart enough to think of on my own. Things that I'm not spiritually deep enough to convey to a dying man. I mean, that was crazy stuff. But we've got a God who's a radical God who can use you to bless, to guard, and to guide someone else. Your, your call from God's going to be different from mine. I stayed for about an hour with James. Again, he was totally unresponsive. I, I left and, and drove home, about a 30-minute drive. And, and uh, shortly after I got back home, there was a phone call from the chaplain uh, that James had died. One minute, I was intimidated and scared. The next minute, I was bold and confident. Not because I'm a bold and confident guy, because you know what? I'm not because the Holy Spirit just guided me to, to say what I needed to say in the ways in which I needed to say it. That's why Jesus says that we have power from the Holy Spirit. We have power. What, what does that mean? Jesus uses the word power when describing the, the movement and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember the New Testament was written in what language? Greek, absolutely. The Greek word for power that Jesus uses here, the Greek word is dunamis, dunamis, from which we get the word dynamic and from which we get the word dynamite. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, you and I are assured of God's presence and God's power. And so maybe you felt an inkling at times to, to maybe take part in a, a mission trip overseas somewhere, but the thought of going to a, a faraway country to serve people who are, are different than you is incredibly intimidating. Uh, but do we trust the Holy Spirit to equip and to empower? Uh, maybe you felt a, a nudge to get involved with a, a local mission here in Roswell and in, in North Fulton or maybe East Cobb, but, but you get freaked out worrying about what you might say or what you might do. Uh, but do we trust the Holy Spirit to equip and empower? Uh, maybe you felt a, a nudge to travel down to Florida with one of our DARE mission trips. We would literally send a team down every single month. Maybe you're scared you'll have to pray out loud or, or you'll have to talk to somebody about your faith and you just feel so unqualified for that. But do we trust in the Holy Spirit to equip and empower? Maybe God's calling you just to, uh, to volunteer in the nursery, to, to rock little babies, to, to show them the, uh, the, the gentleness, the kindness, the, the, the love, the eternal uh, favor that, that God has for them. So Acts 1.8, you will receive power, okay, dynamic stuff. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, okay, local. You'll be my, my witnesses in Judea and Samaria, the, those kind of around us, and over there to the ends of the earth. Now, notice in the scripture how many times in this single verse we find the word you. When Jesus left this earth, he, he had missions on his mind, and he had you and me on his mind. Jesus came as a missionary from heaven so that we might be missionaries for heaven. At my former church, like here, we had a lot of opportunities to take part in missions locally, regionally, and overseas. And when we talked about the international mission trips, maybe one was upcoming or maybe one we just got back from, somebody would invariably say, Joe, why, why are we spending money to, to help someone in Haiti when we have so much need right here in our own backyard? My answer to that was simple, because Jesus calls us to. Uh, yeah, we do surf locally. Uh, we minister to people in our own backyard and those down the street and those in the southeastern United States, and we follow and obey and are faithful to Jesus' call to take it to the ends of the earth. I'm just one imperfect, sinful person. But Jesus is stressing the fact that, Joe, you know, you're not alone. 
The power and presence of your heavenly Father is dwelling within you. And Scripture says that we can do great things on our own. No, we can do great things if we rely on the presence and the power of God and not merely our own abilities. Friends, truth is, you're missionaries. As we leave this place this morning, you, in fact, are entering the mission field. What does that mean? Well, for each person, it might mean something different. And whether it's right here or maybe on another continent, there are people in need. And you and I have the opportunity, I dare say we have the challenge to make a difference in the lives of others. And here throughout the month of February, we're taking a special look at the mission opportunities we have right here, right now. The theme side by side emphasizes the fact that we are not doing it alone. Not only does God promise his presence through the Holy Spirit, God says, I will give you power because of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And so when Jesus, for example, sent out his disciples, he he would send them out in pairs, pairs of two. Why? Because Jesus recognized the fact that we are much stronger than this synergy that takes place when we are going out with others, when we realize that we aren't alone. And so this morning, as we talk about side by side, and we mention a lot of different opportunities for missions to, to make a difference in the lives of others, maybe an eternal difference in the lives of others, I, I pray that we can sense, that we can discern, that we can experience that wisdom, that, that call to action that God is providing. And so as we wrap up our time together we're going to close by doing something a little bit different i I pray that you'll just uh, kind of meditate on what god is calling you to do to, to to reflect on the ways in which god wants to use you because here we've got a lot of opportunities to make a difference Uh, the youth group here for example did you know that they're they're going to kenya in the summer Pray that God's Holy Spirit will just impart on them the right words to say, the things that they need to do, and the right timing and ways in which to do that. We have adults traveling to Kenya as well for a a short-term mission trip. And and we have mission trips scheduled for Peru and Ecuador and Honduras. And and, and closer to home, we have a mission trip to Texas. We have, like I said, monthly mission trips to North Florida where they're still trying to claw their way out from damage from a hurricane. We have missionaries around the globe. We, We pray for them. We encourage them. We listen to them. And we financially support them. And the truth is, so can you. I remember that, that, that call to action that we find in Scripture. Jesus ex- is, is extending to you and, and to me the same opportunity. I dare say the same challenge to you and to me. Remember that call to action that Jesus calls us to pursue. Do you know we, we sponsor missionaries in Egypt, in Burma, in Peru, in Kenya, and other places around the globe. In fact, Chelsea Wolpaul has been a part of our worship team here at Chapel Roswell. Uh, several weeks ago, we, we prayed for her. We prayed for her, her, her husband and their newborn baby because they're traveling to, to North Africa where they're going to spend several years serving as missionaries. I think sometimes we, we, we kind of mistaken when we talk about the, uh, the will of God or God's will for our lives. We think, okay, that means uh, somebody's going to go to seminary and be a pastor. Or when we talk about God's will, we, we think it means, you know, uh, leaving your career and moving somewhere else to, to serve for many years. But, but I think the will of God with God is something that continually comes. Okay, maybe it is a long-term type of thing, uh, but in most cases, I don't think it is. Uh, maybe God is simply saying, okay, Joe, here's what I want from you. I want you to go visit. Visit those people out there who aren't like you. Or maybe God might be whispering to someone, I want you to go work with the youth group on Sunday nights. Or work with the senior adults, maybe during the week sometimes. Maybe that call is something that is just here and now. And how are we being faithful? How are we being obedient to that call? In just a moment, we're going to wrap up with our closing song. And you'll notice in front of you, you've got a, a piece of paper. It says... Uh, mission opportunities or our, our, our mission uh, team here at Chapel Roswell. You can see a lot of the different ways in which we are supporting and funding and praying for missionaries in our own backyard and missionaries around the globe. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this. As we wrap up with our closing song, 
I'm going to invite you to, to come up. We have in these jars, we have some, some silver pens. And what I want us to do is, is get around the, the map, okay, and just maybe write something. Maybe write your name or maybe write somebody that, that, that you want to be supportive of, whether it's through prayers or, or encouragement or affirmation or, or, or just, you know, praying for the ways you can financially support them, for example. And so during the closing song, I'll invite you to do that. Just write wherever you want on the map. Maybe, like I said, just your name and, and let it be a sim, uh, uh, just a, a tangible symbol of, of the ways that, that you're going to respond to that call to action that God sends out. Friends, as we talk about the fact that you and I, when we walk out the doors, we're entering the mission field. May what goes on in here fill the streets out there. Will you pray with me? Well, good morning, most gracious and loving God. We thank you for for leading each of us here this morning, and and we thank you, God, for the ways in which you are at work in our lives. Thank you, God, for the blessings that you bring to us. And Lord, as we leave this place this morning, remind us of the ways in which we are entering the mission field. And may we be blessed with discernment and your wisdom as we respond to that call to action that you are providing to each of us in different ways. Lord, we have the opportunity to to partner with people around the world and people even in our own community. We have a lot of ways, a myriad of ways in which we can serve. And and Lord, how are you calling us to support them through, through our prayers and our affirmation, through our encouragement, through our financial support? And Lord, maybe there are some people here this morning whom you may want to challenge to take part in a in a mission trip. Even if it means, God, taking a a leap of faith and leaving our comfort zone, God, you, you have a way of doing that. Thank you for Jesus who lived and died and arose from the grave. Jesus died so that spiritually we don't have to. Thank you for your grace and mercy, your blessings and your challenges. We love you, God, and we thank you for first loving us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.